Swapnil, can we start? Yes, sir, we are live. Okay. Uh, Swapnil, can you please uh, share the PowerPoint? So, on behalf of the Department of Gastroenterology at PGI Chandigarh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this IBD update program. Uh, for the first session, which will be on bowel ultrasound, we have very eminent uh, uh, people as chairpersons. Professor Raju Sharma is a professor uh, of uh, radiology with a keen interest in GI radiology, and he works at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Rami Reddy is a consultant gastroenterologist, interventional gastroenterologist, keen interest in endoscopic ultrasound, and an innovator. He, is, uh, he works in, in Hyderabad. And Dr. Pankaj Gupta is an assistant professor of GI radiology at our Department of Radiology in PGI Chandigarh. Uh, over to you, chairpersons. Thank you, Vishal, and a very good morning to all of you. We'll begin with a session on uh, the role of ultrasound in uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We have two illustrious speakers for this session, and it's my privilege to introduce the first speaker. We have Dr. Christensen, who's a consultant gastroenterologist at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in Australia, and she'll be talking to us about the basics of bowel ultrasound in inflammatory bowel disease. This will be followed by another talk by Dr. Torsten Kuchazik, and we'll take questions and answers after the uh, two talks together. So we welcome Dr. Britt, and please go ahead with your talk. Hi, my name is Dr. Brooke Christensen. I'm the head of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Unit at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and a board member of the International Bowel Ultrasound Group. I've been very privileged to be asked to talk to you today on the basics of bowel ultrasound, which is a revolutionary technique that will transform care for inflammatory bowel disease patients in the future. So this is just an outline of what we'll be discussing today. We're gonna to mention the equipment that's required to perform a bowel ultrasound the method of how you approach it and the orientation and scan planes that you will see when you perform this test and what findings are important on ultrasound, what defines inflammation and the clinical utility, including disease complications and identifying them. And then finally, we'll discuss some of the limitations of intestinal ultrasound. So what is the equipment that you need? Well, basically any ultrasound machine will do. Um, obviously, the higher quality machine you have, the better images you are going to get. But even you know, in some of our clinics in Australia, we use just a um, portable machine. It's more difficult to identify some of the complications in the bowel wall, but anything will do. You, the important thing that you do need is two different types of probes. The first one is a convex low frequency probe in a three to eight megahertz range. That's a really good probe to give you an overview, identify any complications of the disease and look for the sort of gross anatomy of what's going on. Then the most important probe is this high frequency linear probe. And this is what's used for that detailed examination of the bowel wall to look for inflammation and give you my main, most of the um, information you need with an intestinal ultrasound machine. Then finally, you do need a reporting system Ideally, it's on IT and it can be linked everywhere, but really pen and paper will do if that's all you've got available. So in terms of the method, the great thing about intestinal ultrasound is that no preparation is required. It's a brilliant point of care test, and that's what we do in our clinic. So when patients talk about any symptoms, we get them off to intestinal ultrasound, do it straight away, and get the answers that we require in terms of if there's active inflammation versus functional symptoms. So you don't need any bowel preparation, no laxative, any anti flatulence or any other medications. Furthermore, fasting is not necessary. It is preferable if you're assessing GI motility, but we don't require it in our patients in our clinic. If you are looking at GI motility, um, overall you want a more than six hour fasting state to be able to sleep, assess that GI motility and splenic blood flow. 
So when we approach a patient, we first start with that low frequency curvilinear probe we discussed earlier, and we do this zigzagging pattern over here to look at the overall orientation of the anatomy and to detect any gross changes. That low frequency probe is also good if people have heavier are heavier and you can't get through the abdominal fat, as well as looking at examination of deep bowel segments. Then, as I said, the most important part of the examination is with this high frequency linear probe. Again, it's done in a very systematic performance. Some people start over in the right iliac fossa. I prefer the left iliac fossa personally, starting at that sort of junction between the rectum and sigmoid um, colon, and you go through and interrogate each bowel segment thoroughly and then get to the ileocecal valve and then examine the ileum. It is difficult to continue to follow the ileum proximally, especially if they've got deep pelvic loops. And that's when, again, with the linear probe, you interrogate the whole small bowel with that zigzagging um, uh, way as well. So what do we expect to find on a normal bowel sonography? Well, this is a beautiful picture of a bowel wall. And as you can see, um, there's several layers of the bowel wall that are important to look for. This part in the middle is the lumen of the bowel. As you can see, there's some white spots that are the gas pressing up against the mucosa. And this black line is that first layer of the mucosa. You've then got this gray area here, which is our submucosa, and then the black area again, which is your muscularis, to the white segment, which is your serosa. And that's what we consider the thickness of the bowel wall. So you can see those layers put in nicely with white black. So it's that stripe pattern you want to see. That's just a close-up of exactly the same thing. As you can see, for once you get your eye in, the bowel really does stick out for you. Most sonographers are trained not to um, see the bowel at all and to try and ignore it. But for us, this is what we're looking for. And then you can get in close up and measure that bowel wall thickness. There are two orientations, there's linear and cross-sectional, and we interrogate the bowel in both orientations. So this here you can see is that nice linear pattern. That's what it looks like macroscopically. Um, and you can see again those layers of the bowel wall with the lumen in the middle. And this is your nice cross-sectional image. And again, that's what that represents here with the lumen in the middle and your nice striped layers of your bowel wall. It's important to note in your recording which um, orientation you're taking your bowel measurements from. So when we look at the bowel, there are five main features that reflect active inflammatory bowel disease. First one, which is the most important and most accurate one, is bowel wall thickness. There are varying uh, definitions of what increased bowel wall thickness is. Some say two millimetres, most say three millimetres, and then some people say four millimetres. But it's around that mark, and three millimetres is becoming the consensus measurement worldwide now. We also look for increased vascular enhancement, which is blood flow to the bowel wall, which again reflects inflammation. We look at loss of wall stratification, so those layers that we were pointing out, if that gets uh, murky, which I'll show some definitions later on or pictures of that later on, that also can be a sign of inflammation. We also look for mesenteric hyperenhancement or inflammatory fat, as well as lymphadenopathy, which is probably the least important. So increased bowel wall thickness. Again, you can see here, this is that bowel wall. You can see that measurement, which is measured to be 0.63 centimetres or six millimetres which is obviously greater than your three millimetres, so that's considered pathological. That's again here, that's in that longitudinal section, um, and this is cross-sectional, and you can see again, it's thickened. When we look for vascular enhancement, we put the Doppler on. This has to be standardised, um, but as you can see, there's increased blood flow into that bowel wall, which is significant. Again, this is a girl I did last week, and you can see there's quite significant blood flow in that submucosa, which reflects active inflammation. Then there's loss of wall stratification. As you can see in those earlier images I showed you, there was some nice, those stripy layered um, wall stratification. And here you can see that's completely lost in both longitudinal and cross-sectional images. It's all blurred um, and you've got a thickened bowel wall. So again, another sign of inflammation. And then mesenteric hyperenhancement. This is sort of a sign of our um, fat hypertrophy we see on surgical specimens. And you see how that's all very white in this area here. And that's what we're looking for. Um, and you see here, that's quite um, hyperechoic, which again is a sign of inflammation. So in terms of the clinical utility of intestinal ultrasound, so once I think you start using this technique, um, you can't imagine having 
uh, doing any clinical practice without it because it really does transform your care. So there are multiple ways that can be used. It can be used for primary diagnosis, disease activity monitoring, assessing for inflammatory bowel disease complications, including abscess, fistulas or obstructions and strictures, as well as transperineal ultrasonography to analyze perianal disease, but we won't be going through that today because of time limitations. So this is just an example case of how we can diagnose mucosal inflammation. This was a 17 year old female who had a four month history of bloody diarrhea, intermittent abdominal cramps and loss of weight. She had similar symptoms two years previously, but had had spontaneous resolution. She had no past medic, significant past medical history and was otherwise fit and well. Her blood though did signify inflammation with a raised CRP, decreased albumin and a raised white cell count, while the rest of the bloods were normal. So we performed an intestinal ultrasound and we got the diagnosis straight away. So as you can see here, there's a narrow lumen there, a very thickened bowel wall here. You can see a lymph node up here. Um, and again, that increased bowel wall thickness and then some um, increased Doppler there, as well as this white um, area surrounding the bowel wall, which is your mesenteric hypoecogenicity. They performed a colonoscopy and she was diagnosed with chronic Crohn's disease on endoscopy. So I think it's really important to um, really emphasize that intestinal ultrasound is really good at picking up particularly small bowel Crohn's disease. Um, it has a very high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing a patient with inflammatory bowel disease. And if you actually combine it with a calprotectin, it approaches 100% for accuracy in diagnosing these conditions. So intestinal ultrasound, the main way I use it is to um, monitor treatment response and to work out if a patient has active inflammation when they present with symptoms. This story was a 19-year-old female who had Crohn's disease. She presented to the emergency department with a presumed Crohn's disease flare. She had um, an MRI, which actually demonstrated seven centimetres of inflamed terminal ileum with associated stricture and mild pre-stonic dilatation. We also performed an intestinal ultrasound to make sure that the the two tests sort of aligned. So on ultrasound, she had eight millimeters, um, eight millimeter thick bowel wall. So that's significantly increased. She had fatty proliferation, you can see with that um, mesenteric fat hyperechogenicity, increased Doppler in the bowel wall, some associated luminal narium consistent with the stricture, marked type of vascularity and mesenteric enhancement. So the reason I'm showing you this one is not for the actual diagnosis because the MRI demonstrated she had active inflammation, but to show her its utility in monitoring treatment response. She had four months of prednisolone, which was weaned slowly, was commenced on azathioprine. Um, she had a colonoscopy, which was normal. Oh, sorry, she had the ultrasound, which showed the colon was normal and marked improvement in the terminal ileal wall thickening. It did remain slightly abnormal at four millimetres, but it obviously markedly improved from the eight millimetres previously. The minor hypervascularity on Doppler almost resolved and she had preserved wall stratification. That short area of stricture you can see here where there's some narrowing in that area of the lumen was there, but there was no pre stonic dilatation, so it wasn't significant. So as you can see, ultrasound has demonstrated she's had a very good treatment response, and then we can continue monitoring her with the ultrasound every six months to confirm DPOing. The other thing that intestinal ultrasound is great at is diagnosing disease complications. So the disease complications we look for are strictures, small bowel dilatation, fistulas, and phlegmontan abscesses. So here you can see a patient who presented uh, with abdominal pain, and nausea or vomiting. And as you can see here, this is your small bowel and this is the area where there's a stricture and there's this pre-stenotic dilatation here. This one I think demonstrates it slightly better. You've got a small bowel up here then this tight stricture here and then this area of dilatation proximal to it. You can see very thickened bowel wall at 7.1 millimetres. And as you can see, this is the area of pre stenotic dilatation that was up at 3 centimetres, so 3.06 centimetres. So we say that anything greater than 2.5 centimetres is concerning and more than 3 centimetres is diagnostic thick of an obstruction. In terms of the sensitivity and specificity for picking up strictures, it's very high with intestinal ultrasound, greater than 90% for both. Um, and we use the criteria of a thickened bowel wall, narrow lumen, with that proximal distension, as I mentioned, being greater than 25 millimetres, and proximal dilatation um, being diagnosed as greater than 30 millimetres. It can also help differentiate between inflammatory and fibrotic strictures, 
with Doppler as well as contrast enhanced ultrasound. So you can see whether there's an inflammatory component versus it just being fibrotic. And as you can see, these are some more examples where you've got a very narrow limb here and this pre sternal dilatation. So it's very easy to pick up with ultrasound. So the other one that's really good with uh, the way you find it really useful is for um, identifying abscesses and phlegmons. So this here is someone's terminal ileum. You can see this hypoechoic area here. This is not bowel wall, and so it's concerning for either an abscess or a phlegmon. Ultrasound is very accurate at picking up abscesses um, when we compare it to clinical endoscopic and radio radiological findings. The sensitivity at 90% and specificity at 99%. This is an example um, of a, an area where you go, that's, that could be an abscess or a phlegmon. The way you differentiate is with contrast enhancement. Obviously, this is a subspecialty tool that many people won't have access to, but it is the one time where I think contrast enhancement is a game changer with intestinal ultrasound. If you use the contrast and it fills up, as you can see here, then it's going to be almost certainly a phlegmon. This area here, this is hypochoic area here where you're again worried about an abscess when you use contrast, it does not completely fill up. So you have these areas that remain hypochoic, which is pus. So therefore that's an abscess. This is one we did last week, which was a beautiful um, example of the, important, uh, the utility of contrast enhanced ultrasound. So this was a young girl who came in with a severe Crohn's disease flare. We did an ultrasound and as you can see, there's this region here next to the bowel wall that you're worried about, whether it's an abscess or a um, phlegmon. She was quite unwell, her CRP was rising. So it was important to work out whether we could give her infliximab or not. So we performed this contrast enhanced ultrasound. You can see this area here, and as you can see, the contrast completely filled the area. So we weren't worried about any pus. We did put her on some antibiotics, but we also then gave her a high dose infliximab and she responded remarkably well. All of her symptoms have improved. And she's been discharged from hospital for continuation of um, her infliximab. This is another um, area that intestinal ultrasound can be great at picking up complications. This is an interior enteric fistula. So you've got a small bowel here, another part of small bowel here, and this fistulous tract between the two. The other conditions of intestinal ultrasound can be bringing to picking up is, as I mentioned previously, perianal disease, which is a talk unto itself, appendicitis, constipation, so you can see stool stuck in the bowel. We've used that quite a lot in our inflammatory bowel disease patients. And good for picking up diverticulitis, as well as intestinal obstruction. So where does intestinal ultrasound fit in? Well, the echo statements say it can be used along with MRI and CT as a complement to endoscopy and clinical assessment to detect and stage inflammatory, obstructive and fistulizing Crohn's disease. It's really important to note that intestinal ultrasound changes clinical management and reflects response to treatment. As I said, once you start using it, it transforms your care. We are all moving to a treat to target type um, management with our patients. And this is a really great non-invasive way to monitor our patients and make sure we're actually treating them that way. Yeah. So a point of care intestinal ultrasound can be performed by gastroenterologists. It does has been found to prompt immediate change in the management in 60% of cases. So this is a game changer. It identifies active Crohn's disease in greater than 50% of asymptomatic patients, which results in treatment and escalation in most of those patients. So as I said, it really pushes that treat to target um, ther therapeutic algorithm. And what we do know is improvement in inflammation on intestinal ultrasound reflects response to treatment. So if you do that uh, ultrasound at three months after treatment and they've responded well on ultrasound, you generally know they're going to do well longer term. It does have some limitations. The rectum is not well seen. There are some studies now looking at perianal um, ultrasound, so it's non-invasive in that it's just on the outside of the rectum and you can get good images of the rectum there. At the moment, that's not standard of care with ultrasound. Um, deep pelvic loops can be missed. So if you're worried about the anatomy and getting an overall view, MRI and CT are still better than ultrasound. Terminal ileum, distal ileum are usually seen beautifully, but accurate localization of more proximal small bowel disease can be difficult. And that's, as I said, where that CT and MRI is really useful. So I, if you've got access to it, you do that as a baseline with your ultrasound, make sure they align and you can rely on your ultrasound to monitor the patient's ongoing. And anatomy of complex extensive small bowel disease can be difficult to define. 
So in summary, intestinal ultrasound is safe, inexpensive and accurate. It's increasingly available. So in Australia, where I, I live, about six years ago, there was probably one centre that performed this and now it would have to be greater than 10. It's a technique that is supported by ECHO and GEYSA, which is our Australian um, Gastroenterological Society. It's a point of care test that offers rapid assessment of mucosal inflammation and allows for immediate clinical decision making. Regular intestinal ultrasound with adjustment of treatment to control disease fits with our treat to target paradigm of our inflammatory bowel disease management. It offers the opportunity for aggressive control of inflammation and the possibility to alter the natural history of the disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Britt, for that very comprehensive talk on uh, bowel ultrasound. We will take questions at the end of the second talk and uh, now have the privilege of inviting Dr. Torsten Kuchazik, uh, who will be speaking to us on bowel ultrasound in inflammatory bowel disease, the current status. Welcome, Dr. Kuchazik. Please go ahead. I'm going to share my screen with you. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be there. After this brilliant talk given by Britt uh, about basics of intestinal ultrasound, um, I hope you can all see my screen. Um, I'll give you, uh, provide you some, some further insights into, into recent developments and, uh, and data of intestinal ultrasound in our IBD patients. So those are my disclosures. And uh, actually, I, I want to start to, to show you uh, about three advantages that I see how we should use, uh, why we should use intestinal ultrasound in IBD patients. So first of all, uh, we have a direct reflection of what is going on in the intestine. So we can evaluate transmural inflammation. So you can see here with a patient with, uh, with, with Crohn's ileitis, and it, it directly reflects what you can see during histology. And this holds true for Crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis. The second advantage, uh, and you've already seen this in Britt's talk, is the evaluation of vascularization. So you have a semi-quantitative assessment of, of uh, vascularization, which uh, provides you an information about the activity here in a patient with active Crohn's ileitis in a patient with ulcerative colitis here on the right-hand side. And the third advantage is the evaluation of motility. And there's actually no other cross-sectional imaging that can provide you such beautiful information so rapidly about motility of uh, the small bowel. As you can see here, there's physiological small bowel motility. This is subilius in Crohn's stenosis, and this is dysmotility in small bowel Crohn's disease. And this is very, very helpful inflammation. You already heard about complications. And uh, once you see a loop like this with a short stricture uh, in, the, uh, in the terminal ileum, you uh, immediately know what to do in this uh, situation. So with high sensitivity, high specificity, you can identify those pathologies and um, do um, your um, procedure balloon dilatation right away. This is another example of, of, of a loop um, abscess, as you see on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you see uh, androvesicular fistula. So you can identify those pathological features right away and find the, uh, the, the therapeutic solution by just using intestinal ultrasound. With, using, with high sensitivity and high specificity, you can um, do those examination. So um, there are a lot of advantages. As you heard, it's non-invasive. You can receive fast result. It uh, is, has low costs. Uh, there's no radiation. There's no prep needed. It's patient-centered. So a lot of advantages over other imaging modalities that we use and have over endoscopy, which is invasive, expensive, um, um, and cannot visualize the extramural inflammation or about computed tomography, which has radiation exposure and about on MRI, which has restricted availability. And if you compare the different um, modalities which eat other uh, in Crohn's disease, there is similar accuracy between these different imaging modalities. If you look at the recent um, um, multicenter trial uh, with uh, 284 patients, you see that uh, even if you compare it with MRI, IUS has a high, very high sensitivity to detect small bowel disease uh, features and uh, colonic disease uh, pathologicals in IBD patients as well. And if you ask the patients, they love the methodology. This is an interesting uh, study done in France uh, a few years ago, looking at the acceptability and uh, of different monitoring tools. 
uh, a nationwide survey has been performed in IBD patients, more than 600 patients. And uh, on the very top of the, of the procedures, ultrasonography was mentioned by the patient um, before um, uh, MRI, still collection, colonoscopy, rectosigmoidoscopy. So you can, uh, uh, you can demonstrate the pathologies to the patients right away. They can see whether a treatment is working or not, and you are in direct contact um, with the, the, the patient and can discuss the different findings. And that's why our intestinal ultrasound is now implemented into the ECHO SCAR guidelines. You've already seen this. Our different statements include intestinal ultrasound uh, suggested in newly diagnosed Crohn's, or if you look at response to treatment and symptomatic small bowel disease, uh, reassessment if you want to predict disease outcome or in the post-operative course. So, and the different clinical indications, you can use intestinal ultrasound. And you've seen already similar uh, pictures like this, that it um, detection or, or uh, specific features that we can use for intestinal ultrasound, such as contrast enhanced ultrasound, could be used to differentiate flagments. Uh, this is another example that you see here. You have a difficult situation here in the light lower quadrant. If you use contrast like here, you have the answer right away in, in a couple of or uh, couple of seconds, you see this black hole here indicating that this is an abscess and uh, which should be drained and treated with antibiotics. So the specificity to detect abscesses is about 100% in this uh, trial that has been performed here. And if you compare it with other imaging techniques, the kappa coefficient is 0.97, so very high between CIUS and other cross-sectional imaging modalities. How about evaluation of stenosis? We, are, we have the clinical issue that we want to differentiate between fibrosis and inflammatory activity within a stenosis, which is still difficult, but looking at the echo pattern and using CIUS and maybe also elastography might help you a little bit to differentiate in this situation. As we did here in this 21-year-old male, as you can see here, pre dilatation. This is a stenosis here. If you look at the echo pattern, it's more a hypoechoic, or so appearing more fibrous than notic, which is confirmed here by using elastography in this patient. There are quite a few data on elastography, and the data are still controversial. So it, it appears to have great potential, but it's not ready for complete clinical use yet. But if you combine it with other parameters, so the echo pattern, CIUS, uh, and shear wave elastography, you might have something in the future that might help you to differentiate between inflammatory and fibrostenotic or stenosis. As uh, um, um, uh, Kathy Lou did here, um, she's working in Calgary with Kerry Novak, and uh, she found inverse correlation between CIUS peak enhancement and shear wave elastography indicating um, a, a fibrosis in this situation. How about monitoring IBD? We are uh, um, all aware that this is some kind of uh, um, iceberg phenomenon where we in the past just looked at clinical remission as clinical target, but now we are going deeper. Um, and are looking for biochemical remission or endoscopic remission, mucosal healing, or even deeper in UC, looking at histologic remission or transmural remission in Crohn's disease. And intestinal ultrasound is the perfect methodology to determine transmural remission. Transmural remission becomes more and more important because there are more and more data showing that transmural healing as predictive for a better long-term outcome, as this has been shown in this trial here, where uh, you see the red bar is transmural healing here. If you compare it with mucosal healing and no healing, the need for surgery after 12 months, need for hospitalization, and need for therapy escalation, or need for any outcome is much better in patients with the red bar here who had transmural healing compared to no healing, or even also compared to mucosal healing. This has been confirmed by another trial here from Emma Calabrese's group. She treated patients uh, for 18 months with TNF antibodies. And those are results here. You see a complete response here, complete transmural healing in this patient and no healing in this patient. So after 18 months, it looks quite the same as it did before. 
and then they follow up those patients for another five years. And what you see is that these patients who have transmural healing uh, have much lower need for steroids. The need for hospitalization is lower and the need for surgery is much lower compared to those who have no healing or only partial healing. So transmural healing seems to be a very nice parameter to look at in patients um, with Crohn's disease as a nice predictor. So can we use intestinal ultrasound to monitor our patients? We tried to uh, evaluate this question in a, in a big uh, study that we did in, in Germany a couple of years ago in about 50 different centers. And we looked at different bowel parameters and at the pathology and then started treatment and then looked at the treatment response after 12 months. And what we saw was that the different areas in the ileum and different parts of the colon where we disease are identified and that after 12 months, there was a highly reduction of patients or a high proportion of patients who had normalization of bowel wall thickness after 12 months. In the colon more prominent than in the ileum. And what we saw was that even after three months already, patients, uh, a significant proportion of patients had a normalization of bowel wall thickness and also other parameters. Um, the same could, uh, similar things could be shown here in this pediatric trial where uh, um, even at earlier time points, so two weeks after treatment initiation, those parameters, bowel wall thickness and vascularization markedly and significantly improved in these patients. So with very simple parameters, you can uh, try to follow up your patients. We uh, did a similar approach in a Stardust trial, which has recently been published at the UGW, uh, star, uh, a trial where rustikinumab has been used to treat patients. And after 16 weeks, they had been they went into a treat-to-target arms. We did a sub-study in these patients and did uh, with central reading uh, intestinal ultrasound in these patients at week zero, week four, week eight, week 16, and week 48 to determine the transmural response. Uh, this is an example here from for a patient who has markedly uh, ileal disease here, vascularization, bowel wall thickness. This is after 48 weeks, you see um, the, uh, the terminal ileum went completely back uh, to normal after treatment with ustekinumab uh, after 48 weeks. And those are the results from the complete uh, um, uh, overall population. And what we saw is that after four weeks already, um, we saw um, uh, IOS response in this patient in 20% of patients, which increased up to 35%. And transmural healing, which was a very robust marker, complete healing of all parameters, could be observed in 80% of patients. And interestingly, if you compare a colon to the ileum, the response was much more markedly shown in the uh, in the colon with uh, uh, transmural healing in 32% of patients in the colon compared to the ileum, which was a bit uh, less. So the response in the colon appeared to be better. This could also be demonstrated by looking at the vascularization. This is the overall population. So the effect is, occurs a bit later at week, week 16. Um, and uh, uh, again, a bit more pronounced in the colon compared to the ileum. So what we believe is that if you look at this, um, 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 uh, we discuss about treat to target strategies in Crohn's disease a lot. And if you look at the predefined time frame, have patient with active disease, baseline treatment, and look at inter three months intervals uh, and define treatment targets such as mucosal healing, why shouldn't we use intestinal ultrasound in these patients as well? Look at objective parameters of bowel wall thickness, vascularization, and if the targets are not reached, we can go back and uh, adjust the treatment accordingly. So it appears to work pretty well in Crohn's disease. And the question is, can we, can we also use it in our ulcerative colitis patients? This is an example here of a patient with ulcerative colitis with thickened bowel wall, thickened mucosa, and hypoechoic here, the submucosa, which um, um, uh, uh, correlates with, with edema. Uh, in the submucosa. And this is four weeks after treatment initiation with, uh, with a TNF antibody, and you see uh, it went completely back to normal. We analyzed this uh, in, uh, in a larger cohort in patients with ulcerative colitis in uh, 222 patients at 40 centers in Germany and uh, evaluated bowel wall thickness and vascularization and other parameters. And uh, we saw that in a highly percent of patients, we saw abnormalities in the bowel wall, which uh, went back 
to normal very quickly. So after two weeks, there's a highly significant proportion of patient which has a normalization of the bowel wall as well as uh, the vascularization in this population. So it appears to be that it can be used in ulcerative colitis as well. And as Britt already mentioned, we uh, have a problem with transabdominal ultrasound to identify disease location within the rectum. We can visualize the rectum, but it's difficult to determine our bowel wall thickness. What we can do is use transperineal ultrasonography, which is a very easy uh, method. And this is a nice paper just recently published by, by a Japanese group showing um, that um, by using transperineal ultrasonography with the same probes, we can identify bowel wall thickening and vascularization within the rectum, uh, uh, which uh, um, is correlating very well with, um, uh, with, the, with the mucosal endoscopic disease activity. And after treatment initiation, improvement of bowel wall thickness and vascularization can already be determined one week after treatment intensification and appears to be an excellent predictor for clinical remission in week uh, eight in this population. So again, in combination with abdominal ultrasonography, uh, transperineal ultrasonography mirrors the whole colon and whole intestine that can be followed up by patients with uh, um, uh, IVD. And uh, um, this is, uh, um, at the end, a nice uh, algorithm provided by Maria Taloka, who um, has shown that point-of-care ultrasonography might be a very nice feature to, uh, um, uh, to monitor patients with IBD. In asymptomatic IBD patients, symptomatic IBD patients without positive biomarkers, or symptomatic IBD patients starting treatment using scheduled bowel ultrasonography with point-of-care ultrasound um, uh, and evaluation of the bowel wall uh, in different intervals um, uh, might be helpful. And if the bowel, norm, bowel ultrasound is normal, you can continue to follow up. If it's pathological, you can optimize and change your treatment accordingly. And this is very helpful and you don't always have, need to do a complete intestinal ultrasound. So we believe um, that, uh, and I think this is done in more and more countries, that intestinal ultrasound is like the stethoscope of the IBD specialist or uh, of the gastroenterologist to use it as a point of care um, ultrasound to guide uh, the patient and to follow up the patient. And we believe that intestinal ultrasound should be an integral part of IBD centers. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and are uh, happy to receive your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuchazik. We do have a few questions for uh, both of you. And uh, let me just set the ball rolling by asking you that one of the criticisms for ultrasound has been that it does not provide a comprehensive roadmap of the entire gut like MR entrography or CT entrography does. And evaluation of the jejunum and the proximal ileum is very difficult. How do you respond to that? Uh, that's uh, I, I can I maybe start with this. Uh, this is this, this is good, definitely a good point. I mean, what we usually do in uh, intestinal ultrasound, we um, uh, have a patient with uh, with predominant location at the terminal ileum or uh, this location or an ulcerative colitis patient in the, in the in the left colon or the entire colon, and uh, when we follow our patients, the uh, um, the, the location of disease is usually very stable in, 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 in Crohn's disease patient and ulcerative colitis patient as well. So we don't have to need to have a look at the entire or uh, at the entire intestine in those patients where we do point of care um, ultrasonography. Uh, so this is for follow up um, and looking for, for, for complications or uh, looking for, for disease manifestations. I think there are now quite, quite a few um, um, a paper showing that um, um, that it, it, it is in most situations it is equivalent. And whenever uh, we have or we have a question or aren't completely sure whether we could determine the whole intestine, we can still do other imaging uh, modalities. And even by doing MRI, we all know that the sensitivity is also not a hundred percent as well. Awesome yeah, so I could I'll just add to that, just saying I, I sort of I totally agree with what Torsten said, but it's sort of adding another tool to our armamentarium um, on how we can monitor the disease. So if I have a new diagnosis patient, I will still do my MRE and then I'll make sure my ultrasound aligned and then I can discard the MRI. I don't need to keep doing them every time I see the patient or every year unless it doesn't make sense. So if eventually they're showing symptoms or something's going on, I'm like, this actually is not fitting with the ultrasound. 
I may then go, okay, maybe I need an MRI again in that situation. But it really does, it means that that yearly MRE to follow the patient, you don't need to do anymore because if that first MRI and ultrasound align, the ultrasound is perfect to monitor those patients. We have some questions from the audience as well. And one of the members in the audience has asked, when you are following up a patient, at what point do you start saying that a malignancy has uh, supervened over the background of IBD? Uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, fortunately, uh, malignancy in, in, in small bowel is, is, a, is a rare condition. Uh, but, but it occurs sometimes. You may have a lymphoma. And I, I guess whenever you have a, have a, a patient, in particular an asymptomatic patient with, uh, with small bowel pathology, uh, which does not respond to therapy, I would always uh, do another procedure, uh, MRI or uh, uh, andrography or something like this uh, to take a biopsy or uh, even laparoscopy uh, to see whether there is malignancy or not. Let me and ultrasound doesn't body. take over bowel cancer. So bowel cancer surveillance, ultrasound doesn't take over that. So if they need bowel cancer surveillance, you need to do colonoscopy still. Is my, oh, yes, is that absolutely. Thank absolutely. you very much. Let me hand over to my colleague Pankaj uh, to take on the question. Pankaj, can you unmute yourself? Uh, I'm unmuted, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. And it was indeed a pleasure listening to both the speakers. Uh, I just have a, a point or a question. You can take it as that. Uh, though you uh, mentioned that no preparation is required for uh, performing an ultrasound as a point of care procedure, uh, there have been few studies where uh, they have attempted to do it like a CT andrography like like study, so where you can give small amount of fluid or a protocol where you give uh, a neutral uh, contrast to just uh, distend the bowel and maybe increase the sensitivity of uh, detection of uh, abnormality. What is your take on that? Uh, I, I can start. I think uh, uh, I think it's a good point. Uh, uh, I think usually in most situations, uh, contrast or oral contrast is is not required. If you look at at small bowel pathology and look in particular at, at, at small bowel strictures, and I'm not completely sure if you, if, if you don't find them, it uh, sometimes helpful to use oral contrast. So PG solution uh, you can give the patient 250 mils of PG solution to drink, and then follow up the, the small bowel might increase our sensitivity and there are papers uh, Emma Carr has published a lot about this um, but it's uh, uh, it's I, I think it's not required in our, uh, in all patients or uh, what do you think Britt? I totally agree I think it's very rare it's more if you're worried about that stricture and you're wanting to try and get a better delineation of what's going on that's the only time I would consider it you get beautiful like you just saw Torsten's images the images you get with ultrasound are beautiful and I think most of the time especially if you know where the disease is it's it's an excellent tool just to use on its own. So in the interest of time uh, we have to conclude this session we would like to thank both the speakers for uh, very illustrative and intensive talks thank you very much again. Welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Over to you Vishal. Thank you sir for moderating a very very interesting session and we all were looking forward to. Uh, now, 